Hello, and welcome to the Wheel of Crime podcast. This podcast is ran by two ladies who play games, mumble profanities, and laugh way too often. Also, this podcast does cover co- cover topics of sensitive nature, and as such, listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome back to the Wheel of Crime podcast. My name is Jen. And I am Emily, and some days I wake up knowing how to speak, and other days I do not. So, guess what day it is? <laughs> Always a mixed bag with you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that chaotic, neutral side to me, I guess. Um, but yeah, I guess we're back for another week of the podcast. How are you? Yes. We are, we are back. It is, I think this is going up... What day? So t- we record these episodes like a few days in advance, obviously. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, this this will be going up the last Friday of January. Ooh, the month of Janus. My favorite month of the year. <laughs> My favorite yes. shade of brown. If you ever wonder. <laughs> truly. <laughs> truly the best shade of brown. Yeah. Um. So if you guys ever needed to know more information about the month of January and the history and the criminal history, you got to go listen to last week's episode. Emily tells you all you would ever need to know. Yes, my my very riveting, cold, (laughs) medicine-fueled note topic. (laughs) I hope everyone enjoyed. Um, It was a ride for me as well. We're all having fun here. It's real (laughs) good. Yes, that is true. Uh, I, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I know I, I get to listen to our episodes at least three times. Once when I'm recording with you and then at least two or three times when I'm editing. So, (laughs) so you're like, (laughs) you're like, I will be very familiar by the time we're done this episode. Yes. I, uh, I know all about the month of January and, uh, everything that happened. So in case you you ever needed to know folks. Yes, like I said, super interesting. Um, so, I think I am our number one listener, you know. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> you you closely <laughs> followed by my mom. Uh, oh, yes, love we love Tam Tam. Uh, but yeah, Big no, I was, just, I was just thinking, is there anything from this week that you want to share with the listeners that you've been up to that was interesting or fun or cool or co-worky? Honestly, not really. I... I'm just working a heck of a lot, but this uh, upcoming Friday, when we post this episode, will be my final day on this TV show that I've been working on, and I am the excited about it, because it has been a saga. (laughs) A long time coming, for sure. We've been talking about, I think, for like months now, this, this, uh, your little vacation that's coming up. I know, I'm so excited. I didn't think it was actually going to happen, but it's happening. So, you know, next episode, vacay gen mode activate. Vacation gen, my favorite kind. Exactly, me too. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, I don't know. See, I've also been crazy busy with work, but my I've been working some really long hours, so my headspace, I feel like, for this weekend is just a little wanky. Uh, and I don't remember, like, anything. My memory, garbage. So, uh, yeah, I don't actually know yeah. if I've done anything interesting this last week. Um, I have just been patiently awaiting for the next Pokemon game to come out on Switch uh, Pokemon Arceus. Uh, your mm-hmm. your mm-hmm. John will probably play it, I imagine. Maybe not, actually. I don't know if he's really into Pokemon or not. But um, He is. Uh, he's <laughs> been, like, contemplating if he if he needs it. He's like, I have so many games to play, so I don't know, but I really want it. See, I have like... a lot of games to play, too, but, like, as soon as I saw it was coming out soon, it will it might be out by the time this episode airs. I'm not too sure exactly. But um, I pre-ordered it, and I was like, yeah, no, for sure, I will be playing this. Because it's supposed to be, like, a three-dimensional world, like, Breath of the Wild, but with, like, Pokemon, which could be really cool, because that's kind of something I really wanted to play when I was a kid. So I hope it's going to be okay. Uh, I have my doubts. I've seen some of the gameplay stuff for it, so I'm I'm suspicious. It I'm... looks interesting. As yes. someone who has never played a single Pokemon game, it doesn't seem like my vibe, but, uh... 
You know, I think See, it could be neat for people who love a the little, series. So from what I've seen so far, and not to, you know, claim anything before it happens, because it, it hasn't released yet where we're from, um... It just looks a little bare. Like, you see the people, like, who have played it already or are, you know, a part of the development team uh, releasing footage of gameplay. And uh, there's just... You see the battles and you see a lot of this other stuff. But as for the exploration aspect, what kind of made Breath of the Wild so interesting is that you you had so many things you could do. Like, you could cook Mm -hmm. or you could go hunting or, you know, you could do all these different things. So it didn't necessarily feel like you were just, like, wandering through an empty landscape. Which I kind of am worried that it's going to feel like wandering through an empty landscape. Because the, there's like, no like bushes or like flowers. It's just grass and trees everywhere. And I'm like, it looks a little barren. Like, what's happening? <laughs> what has happened? Well, Where's guess... the flavor? There's like, so I don't, I'm a little worried for that and like anything extra that uh, you could do as a character. Um, but I, I might be proven wrong. It might be like a super fantastic game. We'll have to see. I suppose only time will tell. Word. But yeah, that's about it for me. Um, do we have any show updates to share or anything like that? I don't think so. We do. We have been cooking up some exciting new things for you, Emily and I. We are going to announce very soon a new series that we're doing, which I am very excited about. Yes. And I've been researching and writing for like a maniac for the last three months she's had these because ideas I'm of cooking insane. cooking and brewing cooking, cooking and brewing, and, brewing. And, and get and marinating ready to prepare <laughs> for a for a feast of knowledge yes so that will probably be coming march ish um but we will tell you guys more about that closer to the date once we have more uh, of the uh fine tuning details a little bit more ironed out exactly and uh yeah, I guess with that, we can kind of just jump into our wheel of questions here. Are you ready, Jen? I'm so ready. All right. Number four. What is your favorite type of cat? Of cat? Yes. Like house cat or like wild cat? Either or. Well, I feel like house cats are really their own other than the colors, and I can't make a claim on that because uh, one cat will get jealous of the other one since I have two now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go with wild cats. Um, I feel like uh, as far as like wild cats are, I do really like um, I really like snow leopards, actually. And I really like panthers kind of mm. jaguars and panthers i read somewhere once are, a po- are i guess the same i'm not sure about that one so i'll make a, a tie between panthers and jaguars is like my second favorite and i think that's about it nice yeah nice. well for our listeners i have a black cat and i have a a little he's orange but he's not like vibrant orange he's more blonde which i mean he acts like a blonde so that checks out um <laughs> but he's adorable but we love him he's so sweet but yeah no i think uh that would be my answer um what about you what's your favorite kind of cat i like all cats the fluffy ones are my favorite oh yeah do you know what the fluffy ones are called uh no <laughs> like are you talking house cats yeah Maine Coons are some of the really fluffy ones, or Norwegian Forest Cats are really big and fluffy. My sister has, like, a really fluffy cat named Lucy. She's gray. She's very cute and cuddly, but she hates me, so it's a working relationship. (laughs) It's a work in progress. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's cute. I like that. I I babysat Lucy while they were in Japan a couple years ago, and we had a good little relationship, but as soon as they came back, she was like, ugh, I don't need you anymore. Mm. Fuck off. She outgrew you. She's like, you're my babysitter. I don't need a babysitter anymore. I'm grown up. Exactly. And I'm like, okay, well, you know... (laughs) Just because there's someone else to feed you now. It's right. Turn on me. If I'm remembering correctly, I think my favorite of your sister's cats is Porto. Yeah, Porto's pretty cute too. Just because I also really like his name. I think it's fabulous. He's like a little sailor. He is. He's so cute. He's like so, a little potato. Yeah, like a little... 
happy little guy, a happy little boy. We love him. I love them both. I love both your cats, too. <laughs> you haven't even met the one yet. You know what? It's fine. Uh, but on that note, we should spin for our next question. Number three. How do you feel about people owning big cats? Is this going to be about Carol Baskin? No, um... Uh, I think that if they are people who are respectful of animals and are either working in, like, a rehabilitation process, it's probably fine. Or if this, if, if like, say, for example, if they weren't taking care of them, then they would have to be put down because they're just accustomed to being around people or something. I think in those situations it makes sense. But, like, I'm not really a super fan of, like, people who are like, I have money and I want to own a tiger. I know nothing about tigers, but I think I would like to have one in my house. I don't think I like those people. Yeah. I personally feel like in 99% of cases, it's just really unethical. Mm -hmm. So I am not a huge fan of people owning wild animals as pets. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so basically... Basically the same thing, because I feel like most people don't understand that, like, wild animals have a very, like, niche, you know, n some niche needs and that kind of thing. Yeah. I also just think that there's a lot of misinformation out there about the work that some rehabilitation centers do. You know, it's yeah. not the vibe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, let's spin for our next question. Number two. Did you watch Netflix's The Tiger King? Yes, I did. That was a uh, that was my my pandemic thing that I did. I feel like people were either making um those neat little whipped coffees or they were watching tiger king or they were cutting their own hair and out of those three i watched tiger king out of those three i did all three <laughs> you got you got your perfect pandemic score three out of three <laughs> i cut my own bangs i dyed my own hair i watched tiger king and i made whipped coffee the only thing i didn't do was make sourdough bread and that's because it just seemed too complicated oh, i was almost won over for the sourdough just because I freaking love sourdough bread. But every single time mm -hmm. I've ever made, well, I have, like I make sourdough. Uh, any single time I've ever eaten sourdough, I've always like really overdone it and made myself intensely constipated. So I was like, this just sounds like a recipe for disaster. I will stick to watching people bake their own sourdough for now. And then I never got to, around to get, finding a starter. It looks really cute, but I don't, I just, it, I was working a lot at the time as well, and it just seemed too complicated. Right? Well, you gotta go through the effort of getting a getting a starter, and then there's, like, a whole bunch of other things that go along with it. And, like, um, the price of starters went up, too, because so many people were like, I'm gonna bake sourdough while I'm locked inside. So all these people who, like, had sourdough starters, all of a sudden it was like, uh, oh, no, like, we're, we're running out. Because you need to, like, um, to start... If I'm remembering this correctly, you need to like have it sit, have it sit for like a certain amount of time too, and it just gets it gets really extra. Mm hmm. I know. I just it it was a bit much for me. Maybe one day I'll try it out, but uh, it it didn't happen during the pandemic. But yes. Yeah. All right. All right. I see you. Okay. Let's spin for our last question. What is your opinion on the characters seen in? Netflix's Tiger King. Uh, I think they're all a bunch of assholes. Uh, Carol Baskin probably killed her husband, uh, but maybe not. I don't even know anymore. So much time has passed. And I really don't like that one guy who had like a zillion wives in some kind of weird tiger cult. I thought that was bizarre. <laughs> yes. And that and that's all I have there. And then like I also didn't like either how people were like super casual about like the one person who uh, ended up losing their like arm to a tiger. But then they kept, they still kept working there like, oh yeah, he's just got one arm or she. I, I can't remember exactly who they were. But um, but they were just like, oh yeah, like m my arm gone. 
haha, the tiger ate it. And I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and, yeah, I, I honestly, that's all I remember, really. Hmm. hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, they're very interesting personalities. I feel like the, the series was pretty biased, like, towards Joe. Like, it definitely favored him Mm -hmm. and put him in a better light than some of the other people. But, like, I don't know about Carol Baskin and her husband. I feel like I lean towards she didn't kill him because... There's just no concrete evidence that she did. Right? Well, that's the thing, but... too. It's like, from watching the show, it definitely makes it sound like she probably did. But then, so that's why I say, like, as somebody who watched the show, like, you come out of it and you're like, oh, yeah, she did it. But then, on the other hand, too, like, they're all freaking weird. And also, <laughs> <laughs> like, she probably didn't. Because that's the thing, too, is, like, Joe is, like, so adamant about being like she killed her husband and it's like okay man like you went into a tiger enclosure and then tried to shoot all of them once because of some reason i don't even remember what the reason was like man's is crazy they are all crazy they're all a little wild very and florida joe man. i know is really trying hard for uh donald trump to pardon him but it didn't happen so <laughs> oh, yeah i remember that good stuff but yes. So, any uh, any ideas on uh, my story for you today? Could we possibly be talking about the Tiger King? We are. Do you have any idea which uh, which person we're talking about? Well, if um, you're if we're, this is a revision of notes from our lost episodes, uh, I feel like it'll be Doc that you're talking yes. about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's. We're going to be talking about Doc Antle today. Yeah, yeah. Which is a little scary because he seems like he might <laughs> come after people who talk negatively about him. But um, we'll see, I guess. If he comes after me, I don't give a fuck. Man's is a dick. I will tell him off. I could care less. I'll just put it out here that everything I'm going to say is alleged. And this is a crime podcast, but... We also try and make light of some of these dark situations, so (laughs) please don't sue us, Doc. (laughs) Please no sue. Please. Yeah. Everything is alleged. There's no proof that he has a cult. Yes. That we know of. No proof. That we um, know of. On that note, let's just freaking jump right on into it. Yes, I'm ready. Serenade me with your sweet words about a terrible man. Okay, so today we're talking about Kevin Antle, egg or er, aka Magnavani Bagavan Antle, or Doc Antle. That's a really cute name. Yeah, it's really elaborate. I don't know what what he's doing but he's doing his thing he's doing his own thing yeah so doc antle was born on march 25th 1960 he's a an american big cat trainer and wildlife park operator and the founder and director of the institute for greatly endangered and rare species which makes the acronym tigers and tigers is a 50 acre wildlife uh Preserve, and I put preserve very lightly, just Mm -hmm. so you all know. That is what they say that they are, so I suppose that's how we shall refer to them. Yes. It's in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Antle is also the owner of Myrtle Beach Safari, a tour that runs through his preserve. He identifies as a big cat conservationist. Is he? I'll let you decide. Mm -hmm. Doc credits his great love for wild and exotic animals to his upbringing on a vast cattle ranch in Arizona where he spent his formative years. From a very young age, Doc began raising and caring for every animal that he could get his hands on. As a young man, he also had the opportunity to travel and explore the world and spend a significant amount of time in Asia where he received a quote-unquote doctorate degree in medicine. Okay. Questionable, but that's what he says. So, 
He maintains that he received his doctorate from the Chinese Science Foundation through, though there is some confusion if it was a PhD in natural sciences or an MD, and he's very vague about his methods, saying only that he raises the animals by hand to gain their trust and doesn't use food as most operant conditioning methods do. Yet, most of the photo ops and pictures from appearances show the animals being rewarded and pacified with a bottle afterwards. So, okay, Mr. Mans, the conflicting information. Mm-hmm. Doc Antle made his first big leap into pop culture uh, in 2020 with the release of Netflix's Tiger King. However, he's been facing controversy for quite some time and he has faced criticism from animal welfare activists and zoo experts. In 1989, Antle was fined by the USDA for abandoning deer and peacocks at his zoo in Buckingham, Virginia. In total, Antle had more than 35 USDA violations for mistreating an- animals. In 2001, Antle was on stage with Britney Spears during her performance of I'm a Slave for You, single at the 2001 MTV Music Video Awards, which featured a caged tiger wrangled by Antle and a large albino python draped over Britney's shoulders. Antle has other ties to Hollywood, having worked as an animal expert on films like Dr. Doolittle and Ace Ventura Pet Detective. He has also appeared on a late night talk show that has provided creatures for movies including The War, Rudy Yard, Kinglings, The Jungle Book, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, Mighty Young Joe, and The Jungle Book 2. In 2020, he was featured in Tiger King, and Andal has been accused by animal rights organizations of beating tigers and placing them in unsafe uh, exhibits with filled with sharp wires and nails and failing to provide them with adequate amount of water. In 2020, Joe Exotic, a former zoo operator, accused Andal of killing tigers in gas chambers to make space for further breeding because a lot of the money from places like Doc Andal's wildlife enclosure comes from taking pictures with baby tigers so a lot of people question well what happens when they're not babies anymore right especially if you always have baby tigers but then your adult population doesn't get any bigger they don't stay babies forever yeah Hmm. it's sus if you ask me very sus After fish and wildlife visited Antle at his zoo with federal veterinarians along with the state district attorney, they found no animal violations or evidence of animal abuse. But Antle also assisted the district attorney with another investigation involving another zoo in the state and DNA samples from three tigers he rescued from that zoo when the owner could no longer take care of them. So I feel like he might have had some hands in pockets if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. But that's alleged, not proved. I'm just speculating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So going back to the organization that Antle runs, it's the Tigers or whatever, was founded in 1983 and has two locations, Myrtle Beach Safari and Preservation Station. The first location sits on 50 acres and houses 120 animals, 60 of which are tigers, with a variety of them being rare or endangered. The second is located in a busy tourist area called Barefoot Landing and bills itself as a free wildlife exhibit and living tiger museum that offers photo packages for a fee with tiger cub or a monkey. The animals at tigers are bred solely for profit and some of them are so unsuitable for reintroduction to the wild that their breeding actually has nothing to do with conservation. Tigers are put on display in small enclosures, removed from their mothers for hours of photo ops, and trained to perform in shows, movies, fairs, and television while Antel racks up a list of, like, continually racks up a list of USDA violations. The animals that live there have a life centered around being profit generators, and that's one of the reasons why people tend to think that Tigers is not so great of an organization. Mm -hmm. 
Animals living at tigers have either been taken from the wild or bred in captivity. A 30-year-old African elephant named Bubbles came to the facility after being orphan- orphaned as a baby by ivory poachers. She was trained and put to work in movies such as Ace Ventura 2 and currently lives at the Myrtle Beach Safari location. The whole Bubbles the Elephant thing is honestly, in my opinion, one of the saddest parts of Tiger King. And I don't know if you've seen the second season of Tiger King or whatever that they did. um, I think I only watched up to uh, to like episode eight or something, honestly. There's a couple things where I saw where I was like, this is making me nauseous. And then I put down the show after that, but... I don't, I don't actually know, honestly know anything about Bubbles. Yeah, so Bubbles is like uh, an elephant that Doc's had for her entire life. And she just doesn't look so great. And uh, elephants tend to be like, you know, creatures who need company. And mm-hmm. she's just all alone and has been all alone for her whole life. Oh, that's so she's sad. not a great environment for her. As well as like, he often lets people ride on her back, which isn't great for her as either no that's like a big thing is that people aren't supposed to do that yeah so i don't love that um many of the animals are bred at the facility including crossbred ligers like he has this one called hercules and hercules holds the guinness world or guinness book world of records designation for largest cat in the world and weighs over 900 pounds and is used in educational shows okay educational with quotes around it just Hmm. for uh for reference well because ligers can't um reproduce like once they've been made they're just alive until they die like you in order to make another liger you need to like have another like lion and tiger get together right yeah it's very weird the whole thing It's not the best. So, for anyone who doesn't know, a liger is a cross between a male lion and a tigress and are completely a human construct. They just do not happen in the wild, which makes the motivation behind their use for an educational tool questionable at best. Right. Isn't the same thing, isn't that, like, similar to, like, mules? Because I'm pretty sure mules are um, caused from horses and donkeys, Mm-hmm. having I kids right so. i don't know that much about mules but that would check out honestly yeah those are, only, those are the only two i can think of but yeah the whole thing it, it has an icky vibe to it yeah so ligers are often born with abnormalities that are owing to their bizarre genetic makeup and are considerably larger than their parents and typically have shorter lifespans Due to these issues, they're completely unable to survive in the wild, which means that breeding them only serves to create more captive animals for human entertainment. Their rarity often makes them big attractions, which translates to a large profit potential. According to Liger.org, ligers are, quote, basically freaks bred by un unscrupulous zoos in order to make money out of people willing to pay to see them. The practice is even illegal in some countries as a violation of conservation law. Good. Yeah. Honestly? But, you know, strange to come from a conservationist to have a yeah. like Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Just say it. So, it's interesting. Tigers Doc's organization also breeds white tigers, another draw for tourists due to their rarity. A white tiger has not been seen in the wild since the 1950s, meaning the white tigers seen today are a product of several generations of captive breeding. Inbreeding is unavoidable when attempting to reproduce another tiger with this and several other color mutations, leaving these animals with severe like deficits and no chance of ever being reintroduced into the wild if Mm -hmm. the intent of a breeding program isn't to boost the numbers of an animal in the wild it cannot be considered conservation that's just a fact true that i'm saying not saying it's related to anything but i'm just putting that out there as like a general description of a conservation that that would be what they are yes 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 (laughs) glad you're keeping up oh yeah 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 (laughs) so operator conditioning 
methods that use food and water as a reward for compliant behavior are often used when the animal is hungry or thirsty prior to the reward being offered to ensure effectiveness. This means that in order to get an animal to perform a trained task, food and water are typically withheld for a period of time beforehand to ensure the animal will want to earn that reward. This reduces these animals to begging for a sip from a baby bottle when they'd be hunting in the wild normally. Mm -hmm. The USDA violations against dog cantle and tigers is lengthy, spanning almost 30 years. He was cited for abandoning deer and peacocks on the property at his zoo in Buckingham in 1989 and went on to rack up 38 more violations between 1988 and 2014. These included allegations that he was beating tigers to get them to comply and it like had, they had legitimate evidence of sharp wires and nails littered across their pens and he just didn't provide them with water which i feel like is a basic thing that you should provide if you are taking care of animals yeah well you would assume you would assume so he was cited in 2010 by the usda when a three-year-old tiger named misha escaped his enclosure and ran around freely terrorizing patrons there were no injuries in the incident but antle was cited twice more in the following months for continuing to keep the tiger in the same type of enclosure that he'd escaped from previously fair enough if there's no changes made and he was able to escape at once like like what he escapes again and you're like oh we're so shocked like <laughs> who knew who knew? Yes, he did escape from it once before, but that's completely unrelated. Of course, of course, you know. Right? It's so dumb. So, for a fee, there's very little patrons can't do with the animals under Antle's care. One example is the opportunity people are given to swim with Bubbles, the elephant. Photos showing her covered with people as they swim in the pool at Myrtle Beach Safari depict an image of people using the elephant as a giant raft. Rigorous training must be employed at a young age to ensure compliance when elephants are used for this type of human interaction, which involves breaking the elephant so they lose their free will. Which is Jeez, so That's so sad. freaking depressing. Like, why? Literally, why? And then the people are like, oh, no, it's fine. They like it. It's like, okay, but if a part of their training process is genuinely called breaking their spirit, and you're trying to tell me that they're happy no <laughs> i just it's hard for me to believe personally yes. but that's just me that's yes. one woman's opinion oh yes that's it's just uh it's mm, yes <laughs> so again antle does not outline specific methods how he has trained these animals but it's clear that bubbles has undergone extensive conditioning both Bubbles, who risks injury to her vertebrae from people standing on her like a surfboard, and the humans who are in the swimming pool with a large wild animal, are put in harm's way with this kind of activity. A fairly ominous mystery surrounding tigers is what happens to the cats after the establishment can no longer use them. The USDA allows a very narrow window between 8 and 12 weeks of age for handling a tiger cub. With a tiger cub and monkey photo ops being the primary means of income for preservation station, one would think that Myrtle Beach Safari would be overrun with cats. In fact, Antle has claimed to have trained over 400 cats in his career, yet there are only 60 cats currently living at Myrtle Beach Safari. Where are these cubs going when they turn into adults? Due to the lack of tracking of tigers in the U.S., the short answer is that no one really fucking knows. And right. also... I believe that it's illegal to sell these animals. Especially as, like, pets. So it's like, okay, if they're... If we don't know where they are, and you're not allowed to sell them, and people aren't allowed to keep them as pets, where are they going? They... we. I mean, I would think, you to know, a unrelated. Called heaven? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that they are no longer with us. But maybe that's just other... Uh, preservation farms. Oh, yes, they, they go to the other preservation in the sky. Exactly. Mm. 
Love that. Except for when I don't. Terrible. So one of the few instances that can be tracked took place in 2009 when Antel released two of his cats into the custody of a man in order to transport them who lost his USDA license due to abandoning 75 of his own tigers in Palm Bay, Florida. Their final destination was Zoological Imports 2000, an exotic dealership owned by another individual, a collective drug kigpin, drug drug kigpin the result was another usda violation uh of the animal welfare act so now i'm gonna read you like a little um excerpt from antle's website for his conservation and about the rare species fund that he apparently established So, according to the website, the Rare Species Fund was established in 1982 to provide financial support to on-site wildlife conservation projects and wildlife educational programs around the globe. It goes on to say the Rare Species Fund actively supports the African Association of Zoos and Aquaria in its efforts to improve African zoo collection management, captive animal husbandry, and public educational messages. So, basically, many of their conservation funds are being spent on captivity is kind of what I can conclude from that little quote, which I don't know everything about conservation, but to me, that feels a little not like conservation. Yeah, more, more fishiness. It's all fishy. So another example of conservation work done by the Rare Species Fund makes it sound as if they've released some of their tigers to a wildlife preserve. According to Tigers, they, quote, donated and personally transported seven tigers from our Myrtle Myrtle Beach, South Carolina preservation to the Slam, Sam Tripukna Wildlife Preserve south of Bangkok. The announcement went on to say, quote, a healthy and thriving litter of cubs just heralded the first success of its groundbreaking program. So this sounds great, except for the wildlife preserve in Thailand is not really a preserved. It's actually called the Crocodile Farm and Zoo, and the facility hosts animals for display that include freak animals like six-legged crocodiles, and the announcement boasts that Four color variants of tigers were included in this donation, which means that these animals are inbred for their mutations and can never be introduced into the wild. So any breeding program these tigers are participating in is merely to produce more moneymakers and not for conservation. Doc Andold vehemently defends his right to own and exploit exotic animals saying quote i think that this is our your right to have your own tiger and be killed by your own tiger just keep it in a cage forever and don't let anyone else near you or watch you have it happen so statements like these make it seem as though he's more interested in conserving his right to keep animals rather than keeping animals on the wild right which in my opinion So basically, from what I've gathered, his idea of, like, animal conservation is to conserve the animals for himself, not for nature. That's how it would seem. But who knows? That does seem to check out. But, I mean, it is a mystery. We will, you know, it's just, who's who's to say? Who's to say? So animals used for tourism are generally housed in one location and taken to another in order to perform whatever tricks that they have been trained for in the interest of generating an income. This often leads to physical and emotional stress as the animals are forced into unnatural circumstances, taken from their family or social groups, and forced to comply with the will of their trainer in order to produce a cute photo of. Comparatively speaking, the life of an animal used for entertaining tourists is vastly different from one that would enjoy the wild. Tigers live in a variety of environments in the wild, from forests to mountain regions and savannas, and when used for tourism, these animals are kept in a small enclosure that mimic a zoo and are often transported back and forth in cages from their artificial habitats to the places where person personal ex- appearances are booked. Tigers are nocturnal, which puts them at their most active at dusk to dawn and able to run between 49 to 65 miles per hour. They are active swimmers and can leap heights of 16 feet tall in the name of hunting prey. 
when used to entertain tourists, the nocturnal nature of tigers are ignored, forcing them to perform or pose for pictures when during the day when the paying customers are around and they are kept in small enclosures for viewing or transport between their home base and the next paying gig. Mo- mother tigers give birth to three to four cubs at a time and raise them alone in the wild. They will typically retreat to their den and stay there with their young, nursing the cubs and keeping them to keeping them to the safety of the den for the first eight weeks of their life. They're allowed to venture out but stay close to their mother as they learn to hunt and survive in the wild. Tiger cubs are used pay-to-pet operations and other tourist opportunities are taken from their mothers at eight weeks and hand-raised to allow the cub bond with their human trainers to begin generating profits. In the wild, tigers can eat between 40 to 60 pounds of meat per day, and this consists of game that they've hunted themselves, running over great distances to find food and capture it for dinner. Animals held in captivity don't get near the same level of activity that their wild counterparts do, and thus have their food monitored very closely in order to prevent obesity. This can include withholding food completely outside of a training exercise or performance as a means of ensuring the animal does tricks and their, that their trainer expects. It's been reported that the Liger Hercules, for example, could easily eat 100 pounds of meat per day, yet he's only given 25 in order to keep him from getting the weight that is that more confinement would cause. In the... Um, second episode of Tiger King, which was aptly named Cult of Personality, Mario Trabu's wife, Maria, claims that Antel has three wives and asked others who know him. The figures seem to multiply from three to five to nine. And while this does not explicitly seem like a cult lifestyle at Tiger's, his little organization Andal finally reveals that his organization is run by a great big cohesive family unit so it becomes more evident in the series that he may be in a relationship with three of his employees china regine and moksha who he calls my girls and he also like gave them new names those are not their real names right like and a, like a very cultish thing to do not saying it is one but yeah and one of his former partners revealed in season two of Tiger king that doc Antel forced her to get a boob job so that's not great and apparently he forces all of his uh lady friends to do so but that's all alleged i'm assuming he wants them to be bigger then I'm assuming. It's not the yes. opposite, right? Where he wants them to be, like, flat-chested. Go get your titties taken off right now. Nah, he wants them to be voluptuous. Mm, yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> that is so... bizarre and upsetting that, he that like, him as a partner would be like, oh, yeah, now that you're my girl wife, go get bigger titties. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little concerning don't love that all right nice so he also calls china his long-term partner girlfriend and while we do not learn much about his personal life from his own mouth he goes on to say that he has a complex personal life which is in his perspective not meant for television it's ultimately through barbara fisher's narrative that his lifestyle is exposed and the depths of the cult-like organization that he operates so barbara first joined tigers when she was only 19 and worked with Antel from 1999 to 2007 she reveals that she was renamed bala and that mashka was actually meredith china was actually michelle and regine was actually renee However, names are not the only thing that Antel controlled about his girls. He also decided what they would wear, which was mostly provocative in order to lure more people in. Mm. Barbara also reveals that she was given breast implants, something that she never decided for herself. And she also states that in Tigers, Antel chose young and often virgin girls for his to be his apprentices and they were expected and willing to sleep with him she described antel as having sex with these young women as the divine touch with his penis 
Ew. <laughs> what a nasty little man. I hate him. And Fucking spoke nasty. of these women. Um, and spoke of how these women formed a deep bond with him as he was their first sexual partner. However, Doc Gandal was not pleased with his portrayal in Tiger King and um, told an online uh, news source called Oxygen that, quote, when I say my girl, it's a cowboy saying. It's not that these are my wives. Because oh, sure. he's a fucking cowboy. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, I've had girlfriend and there's girls I've had relationship with that have come and gone over the decades. I am absolutely not married, nor have I been since my wife died over 20 years ago now. And while Oxygen was talking, or while Oxygen was talking with Antle about Barbara Fisher, he even went on to say that she was not his apprentice, but worked as a babysitter for his children. However, it seems hard to believe given the photographs that Barbara shows of herself during her time in Tigers, but Antle dismisses whatever she says, expressing that her words are the, quote, ramblings of a crazy child who has a lot of, in his opinion, issues and somehow those have boiled up. Antle also stated that the cultiest thing about his organization was his belief in yoga. This certainly adds a major twist to everything that we've known about him, but it goes much without saying that Antle's should words should not necessarily be fully believed in my opinion. And I would yeah. have to agree. It sounds to me like uh, how his approach to being challenged is to just gaslight everybody constantly, just based off of even like how he talks with like uh, other people in the show too, and you're like, hmm, what a real treat. What a what a guy. What a guy. But honestly, update um in season two, his fucking mm -hmm. Myrtle Beach is shut down because and all of his animals are fucking taken away because he did not treat them so nicely. Oh wow, shocking. Didn't see that one coming. Yeah. But honestly, like not I'm pretty happy about that. Good. Good for the animals. I'm on teen animals. I don't see, that's the thing is that the animals cannot pick for themselves what happens to them. So in these types of situations where it's like, oh, this person like lost their livelihood. Oh no, like they did this like really terrible thing to all these creatures. I'm like, mm, they're lucky the animals didn't eat them. <laughs> Honestly, he's very I, lucky his tigers see, didn't eat them. Well, that's my whole thing is like, I in some situations, I think the crime should be like uh, treated through causation. So in the, say, abuse of animals, I think they should just put them in the enclosure with all of them and see what happens. Oh no! Just, you don't just see what happens. How you don't the tables feed them turn because of, you need to break them in order for your training program. Oh no! It looks like you're locked up with them now. I wonder what's gonna happen. It's They're very hungry. You. you haven't fed them in a while. You haven't fed them in like a while, and like that's pretty shitty. Like I wonder what would happen if we just locked you. In there. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, it might be it might be called karma. I hear you believe in yoga. <laughs> I do not wish death upon anyone. I just want to make that clear. I, we're just wanting to see what would happen. I'm just saying it, it could be it could be divine intervention if you want to call it that. It could be uh, it could be a tit for tat. Um, it could be <laughs> it could be even punishment for evil cr equal crime. But uh, nature's revenge. <laughs> nature's revenge the sequel like it, it could be it could be one of many things just saying all of this alleged you know i just want to put that out there we're not yes, trying to slander alleged. anyone but do i believe barbara fisher over doc mm, yes mm -hmm. i do too yes i would agree with that one her name's barbara she's just automatically believable it's true. You can't you can't say that a barber's a liar. That's just not a, that's like not true facts. We only have true facts. That would facts just here. be rude. It would be very rude. Hella rude. <laughs> but yes, that is my story for you today. That was one of our lost episodes from the beginning of season three. It was yes. a while ago. It's been a while, cause yeah, basically, um, if uh, any of our old listeners have, have stuck with us this long, we have um, I think it was about seven episodes that got lost while we were recording, cause we wanted to do them in bulk in preparation for not being able to put some time towards the show, and then 
all of a sudden something happened with like the uploading and we just all of them gone and it was very sad (laughs) it was very sad so we have we both have a few more so maybe one day we'll uh get around to fully re-recording all of those but yes that was actually a part one so you guys will have to let us know if you want to hear the part two which kind of goes into the inspo between behind uh doc's alleged cult hey man yeah i'm here for it because uh i i do not like mr man's uh who won't sue us because we aren't talking about him when i say i don't like mr man's um (laughs) we're just talking about man's in general we're talking about men in general i just I, i don't like them some are worse than other ones and some who own tigers i don't really like them but that could be one of many people yeah there's lots of people who own big cats in america so exactly i couldn't be possibly be talking about one in particular um but yeah so with that uh should i do our end of show plugins here jen yeah stick her away all right so um if you would like to check us out further we do have a website which is www.wheelofcrime.com we also have social media that you can look at us on that was kind of a weird way to say that but uh that's on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok all at wheel of crime um, if you want to donate to the show and potentially get a little something out of it, uh, we have a Patreon that is at Wheel of Crime on Patreon. Uh, if you would like to leave us a review and help us re- get get around to more listeners, uh, like a like a couple of little uh, airwave harlots here, uh, you can leave us a review on iTunes because uh, that one's a big one. And uh, leave us five stars, pretty, pretty please. Um, and then if you would like to email us with just a story or an anecdote or something that you had uh, thought about, uh, our email is wheelofcrime at gmail.com. That's it. That's all. And uh, you can tune in next week for another new episode. I'm sure Emily's got another saucy topic for all of you. Oh, always. I, uh, I, well, in my fever state, I apparently also want to talk about the month of February. So I might have to review those notes and come up with something a little more interesting than that. Um, but yes, I'll have some <laughs> super fun for next week for everybody, myself included. And I will, I will consciously be a part of the note making this time instead of letting uh, my night will take over. So that will be much better on that front as well. I hope. All right. Well, on that note, we will see you guys all next week with another new episode. Bye. Bye.